Hi, this is Rosalind Carson back again with Trig Identities from the historical and original way that these were created. So in the first video that I did, uh, we had the students exploring sine and cosine and tan. Sine being the half chord length and cosine being the distance that chord is from the center of the circle. Now the cool thing is, is we had the students generate exact values for the half chord lengths by using whole chord lengths, and this eliminated radical numbers in the denominators. And it also made for a new perspective for the trig equations. We always were using opposite equals hypotenuse times sine, and adjacent equals hypotenuse times cosine. This was eliminating unknowns in the denominator when solving for any sides in right triangles. So. After your students generated a table of values for sine, cosine, maybe even tan, I hope you encourage them to look for patterns. And I always like to split up the class. So there's students who take a little longer to fill in the table. And while they're doing that, the students who are done filling in the table because they were noticing some patterns, uh, I get them to graph the functions. So what are the functions? One of the functions is how does the chord length change as we're traveling around the circle. So it's half chord lengths as a function of degree movement. So I get them to graph that, which becomes the sine function. Uh, then they can try graphing the table of values for distance from center as we're doing the angle movement around the circle. So again, that becomes the cosine function. And again, they might recognize some patterns. So I'm always encouraging the students to look for patterns. In this video, we're going to solidify some of these observations. So your students are making observations, you're having chit chat with the class saying, oh, what are you guys noticing? Are you noticing any relationships between sine and cosine? Here we go. So <clears throat> what I've done here is I always get the students to play with positive rotation and negative rotation because if we're looking for relationships between sine and cosine or even relationships within sine values and cosine values, and we're going around the circle one way counterclockwise why not go clockwise too and see what happens um you'll notice on my circle there's a coordinate grid x and y axes this is because uh as we travel through the trig journey we're going to start well as soon as we start graphing them we're using x y coordinates so i put the circle on an x y grid now if i wanted to put the coordinate of the star on there it is. Now, x, y coordinates, x has to be the distance from the y axis, the distance from the center. That's cosine 30. And this is why I love defining cosine as the distance from the center, because that is the x value in the coordinate. The y value is that half chord length, the height from the horizon. That's sine 30. And if I want to find the coordinate of the star, if I travel negative 30 degrees, there's the coordinate. I would say cosine negative 30 as my distance from center, and sine would be that half chord length dropping down into quadrant four. The interesting thing is once we get into quadrant one and quadrant four, the y values are different. And you'll see that sine 30 is a reflection about the x-axis with sine negative 30 in this picture. So the reflections of each other. So I love this visual because no matter where we draw our angle movement around the circle, so have the students play around with that, they'll see that the sine value of the positive rotation is a reflection of the sine value of the negative rotation. And the cosine value is always going to be the same whether it's a positive rotation or negative rotation. Let's take a closer look. We already figured out that sine 30, the whole chord length was 1, so the half chord length was 1 half. And if I'm looking at that negative rotation, that y value has to be a negative one half length. So I highlighted it there for the students so they can see it clearly. Obviously, if I'm going to drop down negative 30 degrees, I get the same magnitude as the positive degrees, but I'm just taking a negative value of it because now we're in quadrant four. So we get this relationship between, for sine, between positive rotation and negative rotation. Um, so we're seeing some observations. Let's look at cosine. This is what I love about this diagram. I love that we generated the sine and cosine values using the circle and doing that, if I'm doing any positive rotation at a negative of the same amount of rotation, 
I get exactly the same line segment because cosine is the measurement, the distance from the center to that chord. It's always the same line segment. So cosine of 30 is the same as cosine negative 30. It'd be the same as if I said, let's try, uh, figure out the distance at um, 42 degrees. So cosine 42 is still that line segment along the horizon, the x-axis, and cosine negative 42 is the same line segment. So in the picture, no matter where you draw it, same line segment, they're equal to each other. There we go. So cosine of a negative rotation is equal to cosine of a positive rotation because it's the same line segment. So these are important identities, even though they seem, I find that in some curriculums, they, they stop looking at this. And they did this in Alberta, and that's very interesting to me because I don't know why. Um, because if you're gonna play around with trig and you're playing around with positive rotations, why not do negative rotations? Same thing if you're graphing the equations. Instead of just going from zero to 360 degrees, why not extend your graph into the negative x-axis and go to negative 360 degrees? It's just a pattern. Play around with it. See what other relationships you see. So that's what we're going to do. As mathematicians, we're always curious to see if there's any other relationships. And again, students might have noticed a relationship between sine and cosine when they were either graphing it or in their table of values. And I also know there are students, and you know who they are, who have trouble seeing patterns just with numbers. So if they looked at their table of values, maybe they don't see a pattern. So we're going to give them a visual so that they can help see this next relationship, a relationship between sine and cosine values. So this time I'm going to get the students to draw their own circle, their own xy axis, and they can pick their own angle of movement. I'm going to draw my angle of movement in quadrant one, but in this activity you can have students draw in quadrant one, two, three, and four, just for the whole purpose of showing that this works for any angle movement. Okay, so I'm going to move angle theta from the horizon. My radius is still one unit long. I know the half chord length is sine, and I know the distance from center is cosine. Okay, so we have a relationship set up. Draw my x, y axes. Wherever you draw your angle movement, this is the task. We're going to complete the rectangle. Kind of sounds like complete the square. It is complete the quadrilateral, the special quadrilateral being the rectangle. So wherever you drew in your angle movement, we are going to complete the rectangle by drawing in a line perpendicular to the y-axis, wherever, whatever quadrant you're in. I'm going to highlight this rectangle. It's green. The task for the students now is just to find all the side lengths of the rectangle. Two of them are already given in our original drawing, one of them being sine alpha and cosine alpha. Well, let's see if we can label the other sides of the rectangle using another angle. Okay, you didn't have to use this one. I use this one because I know that the y-axis and the x-axis are perpendicular to each other. That's a 90 degree angle in there, therefore angle uh, theta is 90 minus alpha. But you can have students play around with all the angles in those triangles and come up with an expression to represent those angles. They could label the sides of the triangle from many different angles, okay? So this is where you have a little bit of fun playing with it and then looking at the opposite sides in the rectangle. So let's start labeling the sides of the rectangle. If that angle in there is 90 minus alpha, then the opposite side is hypotenuse, which is one, times sine 90 minus alpha. And the adjacent side is cosine 90 minus alpha, because again, the hypotenuse is one. All right, so now in a rectangle, elementary geometry here, opposite side lengths are equal length. That means sine alpha is equal to cosine 90 minus alpha. Hmm. So students might have started to see this relationship that the sine values were repeated later as they traveled around the circle with the cosine values. The magnitudes were the same as you were traveling, but they were shifted. They weren't the same values at the same time except for at 45 degrees. So once you pass 45 degrees, sine got a little longer, cosine got a little shorter, right? So you're playing with these values, they're seeing there's a little bit of a relationship. Here we're starting to solidify what that relationship is. It's a 90 degree shift from each other. They might see it in their graphs.
Okay, so these are important identities to lay the foundation for all the other trig foundations or trig identities. We need to know that cosine is a 90 degree shift of sine and sine is a 90 degree shift of cosine. Um, but I love the rectangle picture because for those students who have a hard time seeing it from their graphs or their table of values, they see it with the rectangle because we're back to elementary geometry and we're back to this really nice formula of opposite equals hypotenuse times sine to label the sides. Pretty slick. All right, so so far we have these trig identities. And again, these are foundational ones to develop all the rest of the trig identities that we need for, in Canada, grade 12 math. Um, in the States, it's Algebra 2. So stay tuned for the second video. And uh, we're going to draw another clever rectangle with the circle to generate the rest of the trig identities just using the same image and the same perspective approach of opposite equals hypotenuse times sine to label the sides of the rectangle. All right, see you next time.